All right, greetings everyone and welcome back to the final um, the final installment of our lecture on evolution by natural selection. So um, today we're actually going to discuss uh, types of natural selection, but uh, also discuss um, other scientists that contributed to our understanding of evolution by natural selection. So um, there are what's important to remember is we we've just we have talked about patterns of, of macroevolution um, but we really should be focusing in order to remember to talk about how macroevolution occurs you have to understand how microevolution occurs because remember small changes over time add up to big changes so there are really five methods of of selection and one of them is actually not natural so we call it artificial so um otherwise uh we're going to discuss it in in this order um directional disruptive sexual and stabilizing selection and try to explain uh what those are and um, what they look like so i have an example for each so the first type of natural selection that i want to talk about is directional selection um, which really is favoring these extreme traits. So you're going to find that one end of the spectrum is favored over the other end of the spectrum. And for our example here, I'm going to use one that we've already talked about in class, which is our case study on peppered moths. Um, you might recall that um, before the Industrial Revolution, um, all of the trees uh, it, where the peppered moths lived in that habitat were uh, light in color. So the moths that survived tend to be the lighter colored moths because they were able to blend in with the tree. And and here, actually, let me sh let me show a picture and then I'll come back. So these moths right here were the ones that survived pre-Industrial Revolution because they blend in. A darker moth, this one right here, um, would have died because it would have stood out like a sore thumb. But remember, post-Industrial Revolution, all of the tree trunks were were covered with this, well, this one actually looks like it's been burnt, right? This this tree, it's so heavily covered with soot, it looks like the tree was almost in a, in a fire. Um, so uh, in, in that instance, sorry, in that instance, it was these light colored moths that were selected against, and these were selected for, right? These were selected to survive essentially by nature because they were able to blend. So um, if I go back to our graph here, um, you're going to notice that I'm actually graphing them in a dark forest. So if the forest is dark, um, we are going to see right here our y-axis is looking at the number of peppered moths. Look at how many dark peppered moths we have, right? If this is all the way on the light end of the spectrum and this is getting darker and darker moths down here, um, we have significantly more darker moths in a dark forest because the dark moths... Um, were the ones that are able to blend and survive. That's directional selection. You'll notice we have very few, right? If this right here is zero on our number line, on our y-axis, if this is zero down here, we have very few moths at that end of the spectrum because they don't blend. Um, birds spot them quite easily, pick them off of the tree, and they all die and aren't able to pass on um, that trait, that color, to uh, the next generation. And so the only moths that end up surviving for generations and generations are the darker colored ones. So that's directional selection. That's pretty easy for most people to understand because we see that all the time. Now, uh, the next one I wanna talk about is disruptive selection. Uh, disruptive selection is similar actually to directional selection, but um, selection at both extremes, not just one extreme, but both extremes are actually favored. So I wanna talk about weeds. Um, remember, there's no actual scientific definition of a weed. A weed is nothing more than um, is nothing more than something that we find <laughs> that we don't want human beings. Um, if you actually look in nature, right, weeds don't exist. Plants just grow where they grow. Um, but when we're talking about how we think of weeds, weeds have really um, evolved to operate to um, occupy two different niches so I'm gonna try to graph this here this is disruptive so you're gonna notice in this graph I have a lot of weeds that are really really short and I have a lot of weeds that are really really tall so the question is um, you know why why is this the case why are there a lot of weeds that are really really short right here um, and all of the weeds that are surviving on this end of the spectrum or occupying this niche are weeds that might survive in... Now, you'll have to forgive me because I'm writing with my mouse here, which is a little hard for me to do. I'm not very good at that. 
but these are weeds that would be able to survive in your lawn. Because if you think about it, we're constantly cutting our lawn like once a week in the summer. So the only weeds that would make it are weeds that don't get clipped by the lawnmower. So weeds that are short, like crabgrass, survive really, really well in the lawn. On the other hand, if you're surviving in the lawn and you're a tall weed, you get snipped, right? But then that begs the question, why are there still a lot of tall weeds on the planet? Um, and really the reason for that is these are gonna be wild weeds. So if you look in a ditch, um, right, where there's not a lot of cutting happening, you'll notice um, these Phragmites weeds uh, are really successful. And I'm gonna show you a picture of both of these right now. So uh, let, me, let me just uh, better illustrate this for you. Um, here we go. So these are gonna be short weeds that survive really well. So you'll notice we've got dandelions. Now the dandelion, you might not think of it as a short leaf because obviously it erupts out of, uh, out of your grass but the majority of the plant is still really, really short, right? You can actually see that leaf right here. Um, this part of the dandelion wants to be tall so that when the breeze picks it up, it spreads. These are all the seeds, right? And then it, it spreads along your yard. Obviously, dandelions have become incredibly successful because we see them all over the place. Uh, right here, this crabgrass is another example of a very successful weed because um, it uh, grows horizontally, right? It grows in this direction and that way when you cut your lawn, because you, you clip it vertically, you clip the blade vertically, crabgrass, which grows horizontally, um, is incredibly successful and has evolved to be successful. These weeds have evolved to be successful because they're short. On the other hand, this right here, you guys have probably seen this, um, this weed has completely taken over cattails. Um, in most uh, wetlands here in Wisconsin. Um, this is actually an invasive species. It is indeed a weed, but it's successful because of how, how tall it is. So the reason it, it is successful is because it outcompetes for sunlight versus shorter weeds. The shorter weeds end up dying out in a wild environment because they just don't have enough sunlight to photosynthesize and survive um, and pass on. Um, their traits to the next generation. So again, this is disruptive. We've got short on this end of the spectrum and on this end of the spectrum we have tall. And weeds in the middle in between these are not really effective. So if I go back to my graph, right, um, we don't have a lot of medium heighted we weeds for that reason. So all right, so the next thing I want to talk about, so we talked about directional and we talked about disruptive. Now let's talk about essentially the opposite of disruptive, which is stabilizing. In the previous graph, I showed you essentially um, like a like a U-curve, right? Now stabilizing selection looks more like the common bell curve, right? Where we don't have the extremes selected for, actually the extreme traits are selected against. So Weight of newborn babies is an example of uh, stabilizing selection, right? So we don't have a lot of babies being born that are, you know, right here that are about three pounds, let's say, right? Because babies that are born three pounds are probably premature, um, and a lot of them sadly don't survive, right? We've gotten a lot better that with, with modern medicine. Um, but what about babies that are like 15 pounds, right? <laughs> There's not a lot of 15 pound babies either because that makes for very difficult pregnancies and so on and so forth. So most babies are born right here, somewhere in the middle, right? Most babies are about seven you know, to eight pounds. Um, so we say that that's a stabilizing selection because um, it falls somewhere in the middle. It stabilizes. Uh, uh, and right, we see that. We definitely see that. We don't see a lot of like little Thumbelina babies. Obviously, this is just art. Um, but we also don't see a lot of these gigantic <laughs> chubby babies, even though they obviously exist, like little Michelin men. We see babies more in this spectrum right here. Look at how cute those babies are. So that's stabilizing selection. Now, the next is um, those three that we talked about are the most common in nature. This one, though, we do see as well, sexual selection. Now, the, di the difficult thing about sexual selection is... Um, sexual selection can occupy one of the other three that we already talked about. It really just depends. So for instance, right, if you were looking at human beings, human beings undergo sexual selection, right, where traits um, from the opposite gender are selected for, right? We um, choose to mate with someone else or choose to date and marry someone else based on physical attractiveness, right? The same thing happens with other animals, right? Uh, with other animals, though, it might be 
like in this instance, I might be talking about the Irish elk here, and it happens to be the size of the elk antlers. So um, as it turns out, um, the female uh, elk, Irish elk, now Irish elk don't exist anymore, um, but female Irish elk, when they did exist, preferred male um, elk bucks that had massive um, antler racks. We're talking 12 feet across, which is just amazing. Um, that they were able to shed these antlers and regrow them every single year. Think about the massive amount of mineral resources that that would require for that animal. It's just phenomenal to me. But um, so we actually see something that looks incredibly similar to directional selection, right? This looks exactly like the first graph that we did because in this instance, right, does um, elk, female elk, did not prefer bucks that had really really small antlers right they wanted really really large antlers um, so that's what we end up seeing right we actually have specimen of irish elk you can see them here um, like so here's an irish elk right there compared to like a modern day moose and then you can see all the other um uh, we call them we call these uh, uh persodactylids all these uh these deer species but just the, the, the massive amount of resources that went into their antlers is amazing. Now, ultimately, this type of natural selection was to the detriment of the Irish elk because we believe that part of the reason they went extinct is because um, as they were trying to escape saber-toothed tigers and other animals that hunted them, that uh, they probably could not escape into the forest, which is where they would be more successful, right? Where they could um, you know, move in and out of trees because they are not gonna outrun a tiger, right? So their um, agility and being able to move back and forth between trees would have made them more successful. But if you're trying to move between trees with an antler size that spans 12 feet, good luck, right? You're going to clothesline yourself. And so ultimately, this sexual selection that favored larger and larger antler sizes over many, many, many generations probably also sadly led to the demise of the Irish elk. So... All right, the last one that I want to talk about is actually not natural selection. It is by definition the opposite. It is artificial selection. And this is something that human beings do. We actually will breed um, animals artificially, things that are unnatural, right? We see this all the time. I see this with my dog. I have a little pug, right? This, my little pug, Pugsley, does not have a pressed in face and all these folds and everything because it was somehow advantageous for him to have that, right? It's actually more difficult, right? Pugs and other breeds like him um, are more likely to develop skin cancer for that reason. Uh, Pugsley also, because he has such a, um, such a short face, um, is also more likely for his um, eyeballs to dislocate from his head um, and uh, he's more likely to have breathing problems because of his short, short nose. Um, so we say that that's artificial selection. That's just us choosing to breed a pug the way that pugs currently look because we like it. We think it's cute. All right. Now we can see the same thing again, looks like directional selection, but we can see the same thing with other things that we've bred. This one's a very, I really love this one. So this one's looking at the boxiness of tomatoes. And you'll notice that what I'm graphing here is we have a lot of tomatoes that are incredibly boxy and very, very few tomatoes that are not boxy. And that's because human beings have actually genetically engineered a variety of potato, of tomatoes, sorry, that are more cube shaped. Now they're not perfect cubes, um, but they're a little bit more cube shaped and uh, different cultivars have been uh, grown of these types of tomatoes just because they package easier. Now, is it advantage? Is it an advantage for the tomato in any other sense to be boxy? No, but it's an advantage to human beings because you can pack more in a box if they fit closer together and they're less likely to bruise, right? If they're not rolling around, right? Round things roll during transport. So boxiness, boxy tomatoes are artificially selected for, not because the environment is somehow better for them to be boxy. All right, um, the last thing that I wanna talk about is um, how we actually show how we actually show evolutionary relationships. And then finally, remember the other couple scientists that helped contribute to our understanding of that. So um, there are two charts that will show uh, how we decipher, um, how we show relationships, right? They kind of look like family trees or pedigrees, but they're a little bit different. This first one you'll notice actually shows a timeline. 
um, and it shows you know different extinction events. Extinctions always occur. Um, you can see that they end on the timeline, but they usually give them a different color. In this case, red. So if they're showing on a timeline. Um, whereas this is branching out in time a little bit earlier. Um, we call that a phylogenetic tree. Whoops, sorry about that. That's, how, that's one type of a way that we can show how different um, species are related to one another. Um, another way that we can show them, though, is um, by looking at what we call clades. You know, you can actually look at the difference between mammals or amphibians or... Um, Right, you can actually see that here, right? These are cartilage-based creatures. These are when we first developed bones in, in these fish. Um, and then when we started to become amphibians, right, you can see that branch. Uh, and then you'll notice this branch ultimately led to both dinosaurs, humans, and whales. So dinosaurs and mammals actually share a common um, clade, we call them. We call that a cladogram. You'll notice there's actually no timeline. You could think of this right here as the timeline, like moving up in time, although that doesn't entirely make sense because look at this dinosaur right here. Obviously that thing went extinct a while ago, but it's actually sh more showing um, different relationships. So these are a little bit different um, and uh, it, knowing how to understand and be able to interpret these things is pretty important. And I'll have a few questions for you on, on that. So last thing I want to talk about, remember, is who else helped Darwin with his understanding? Darwin was not the only person that contributed to our understanding of evolution. The first person that we know of that helped with our understanding of, of evolution was actually this French dude um, in the earlier 1800s. Um, and his name was Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. And uh, he didn't get everything right, but he did understand that um, animals changed over time, right? So um, Lamarck is actually famous for other things. He is responsible for naming over 1,700 um, species of animals and plants. And um, he came up with this theory called the theory of acquired characteristics. Now, this theory is wrong, but again, at least he was getting to the point where we were now finally understanding that things adapted to their environment. Now, how they adapted, remember, is incorrect, but this is what his theory was. His theory um, was that um, if I obtained a trait over my lifetime, I could pass it on to future generations. Um, so um, as an example, right, if I built huge muscles, I'm a bodybuilder and I'm packing on these muscles, I could just pass on big muscles to my offspring. Um, we ultimately rejected that as a scientific community because you can't pass on acquired characteristics. You can only pass on heritable genetic traits, right? They have to be part of your DNA since the DNA is what ends up in the sperm and the egg, not you know, how big of muscles. Muscles don't end up in your sperm or your egg to pass on to the next generation. Only genes do. So um, there's this really famous picture that Lamarck came up with, right, where we actually saw, we call this Lamarck's giraffe. Well, a giraffe, you know, wasn't able to reach the branch that it wanted to, and the only the successful giraffes that could reach the branch were able to eat, and so they stretched their necks out, and they just kept stretching them out, and as one generation stretched it out to reach, it passed on that stretched out neck, but remember, that is ridiculous. This is not true. You cannot just stretch out your neck and then suddenly you have a longer neck that you pass on. Um, even if you did somehow dislocate your neck, right, you're not passing that on because you didn't fundamentally change your DNA, right? A really, really ripped caveman doesn't just give, uh, <laughs> doesn't just uh, have a child that's super ripped, right? This is a joke. So Lamarck had it wrong. Um, there is no such thing as the theory of acquired characteristics in nature. He also theorized um, a theory of use and disuse, saying that if we use organs more, they'll become bigger and more emphasized, um, and that organs that aren't used will become will eventually vanish. And this does make sense, right? You would think, you know, why would I have something that I um, would no longer use? But there is something uh, that's wrong with this theory. If a trait does not disadvantage you in any way, there's really no reason to get rid of it, right? Humans, for instance, still have tailbones, despite the fact that we don't use them for anything, right? Humans still have appendices, despite the fact that that is, bi that is certainly a vestigial organ. Most of us don't use our appendix for almost anything to the point where a huge chunk of the population ends up getting that thing infected and has to have it removed. Are there a lot of ill consequences that occur once people get their appendix removed? Not really. So it's not that the appendix 
will be weeded out, right? People are still being born with appendices every single day. Um, now, on the other hand, if the appendix somehow made us more vulnerable to disease, yes, the appendix would probably go because those people would die and not pass on their offspring. But uh, this theory of use and disuse, um, while it may make sense, it is also um, not correct. All right. Uh, the, the last person that I want to talk about, and this is the last slide of our lecture, is Alfred Wallace. Um, it is important to note that Charles Darwin was not the only person ready to publish a book. Um, Alfred Wallace, which is an Englishman, um, was also going to be publishing his book. Um, as a matter of fact, he reached out to Charles Darwin for some, some feedback on, on his uh, manuscript. And Charles Darwin w was so uh, upset about the fact that someone would beat him to the, the, the ideas that he had come up with 25 years prior um, that he quickly published on the origin of species first before Wallace could get his book out. So um, it is important to note that uh, if Darwin did not get this theory of evolution out there, right? There were other people at the time that were coming up with very similar theories based on the evidence. And I think this is just another testament to the fact that evolution is just as scientific as gravity because many, many people were seeing the evidence and seeing that evolution by natural selection, that adapting to environment and passing on um, beneficial genes made sense and again, um, was backed up by um, scientific evidence. And that is it, folks. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a great day. And um, as always, if you have questions, drop them in the comments section or reach out. Take care. Bye now.